Designing a ship is a massively complex operation. These things can be the size of city blocks, and they have to function safely in a constantly changing, unstable environment. It takes brilliant engineering and mathematical precision to make sure they will work because one small oversight can have disastrous consequences. In the past, we looked at five maritime engineering failures, including the Lusitania's serious vibration issues and the failed launch of the Principessa Yolanda. But today, we'll look at three more engineering failures that range from the harmless and comical to the downright deadly. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and here are three more ship design failures from history. Ships like ocean liners and warships are obviously designed to fulfill a specific purpose and their intended role actually impacts the design of the ship, its actual structure way more than you'd expect. Take for example, rolling. A passenger ship needs to be designed to maximise passenger comfort. So shipbuilders actually need to decide just how they want their ship to roll and then they can adjust this by designing the ship's metacentric height. Too large and the ship will snap back and forth in the waves, flinging crockery from tables and resulting in a miserable experience. They're too small and the ship will roll slowly and seem to not want to come back. It's a surefire way to trigger seasickness in most. Complex math has to be done and engineers try to strike a happy balance between the two. Down below, the ship's power plant is also crucial. Different ships need to go at different speeds and some of the fastest of their time were ocean liners. But shipbuilders didn't always get it right. The Asturias and the Alcantara were two new proposed sister ships for the vaunted Royal Mail Line that were supposed to carry the company into a new age, but a misstep in their engine design would see them become an embarrassment and relegated to the history books. Ocean liners needed to go fast, it's what they existed for in the first place, to get people across the world's oceans as quickly as possible. It wasn't just for passengers' comfort either, it all had to do with profitability and good business. A company in the 1910s would have needed three or four medium-sized ocean liners to maintain a regular weekly crossing schedule across the Atlantic, but that many ships incur a lot of running and maintenance costs. By the 1920s and 30s, you could replace the four with just two larger, faster ships. If the ships were bigger, they could fit more people and it would create more profit. So speed for ocean liners was absolutely paramount, and that guided the way that they were designed and built. Shipping companies would commission the ship to be built by a shipyard, but crucially only a small amount of money changed hands at the start. It was up to the shipyard to finance building the ship, and then to demonstrate that the ship could achieve the speeds and performance that the owners needed it to. And only then would it change hands and be paid for by the new owners. And so it was in 1925 that the RMS Asturias was on her sea trials to demonstrate her speed when all on board were bitterly disappointed that the ship's top speed was way slower than ships that were 10 years older. It all had to do with attempted innovation and more than a little bravado. See, back in 1924, the head of the Royal Mail Line was Lord Kilsant, and he was also the chairman of Harland and Wolfe, the shipbuilders in Belfast. And I've actually covered Lord Kilsant on this channel before. He's the cheeky devil who ran the White Star Line into the ground and racked up over a billion dollars in today's money worth of debt. His baby was the Royal Mail Line, a company with a vast fleet of ships. But in the First World War, the company lost many of its vessels, which was of course a devastating blow. They had got back on their feet by rebuilding cargo ships first, but then in the mid-1920s they were ready to replace their prestigious passenger ships that had been lost in the war. And one of the more lucrative routes for the Royal Mail Line was in South America, where the ships would call at Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina before heading back to Southampton, England. Now as always, speed was the critical factor. A pair of fast, large, modern sister ships would increase profitability for the company. And here is where Kilsant was presented with a choice. What kinds of engines should the shipyard install? Steam engines had been used for decades. It was the propulsion system that actually birthed the ocean liner in the first place. But by the time of the First World War, an innovative new kind of engine had arrived that today we're all familiar with, but which back then was a radical departure. In the late 1800s, a German engineer was making an engine that ran by compressing air and mixing in liquid fuel to create combustion, and his name was Rudolf Diesel. Now the diesel engine, you may have heard of it before, back in the day it was a huge deal for a number of reasons. In land-based vehicles it got rid of the need for spark plugs, 
And diesel engines on ships were an even bigger deal because they could do away with bulky coal. Coal was a nightmare to work with. Refueling took literal days and it required the installation of massive boilers fed by hundreds of men to burn the coal and create steam for the engines. Diesel engines installed on ships could draw fuel oil from tanks and ignite it in the engine itself. It would mean there would be no need for boilers, no hundreds of stokers, and no days long refueling process. Nowadays, the technology has been perfected and diesel engines are the standard at sea, but back in 1924, when Lord Kilsant was plotting out the two new Royal Mail ships, it was like uncharted territory. He needed Asturias and Alcantara to do 20 knots exactly. The speed would keep them on time and profitable. Now, he could choose to fit steam turbine engines, but these were expensive and they took up a lot of space. They were standard for the era, and they would be for many more years to come, but the ship's bottom levels would be totally occupied by the massive amount of necessary boilers. To run in reverse as well, the turbines needed complicated and delicate gearboxes. If Kilsant chose to use a diesel motor setup, the massive cavernous space that would otherwise be used for boilers could instead house cargo, and the diesel engines could run in reverse at the drop of a hat. As head of both Royal Mail Line and the ship's builders Harland and Wolfe, he had the final say and he decided to go for it. It would give him and his company bragging rights to suggest that they were leading the technological charge. The diesel motors would be built under license at the shipyard and would be, at the time, the largest yet built. Now crucially, this wasn't Harland and Wolfe's first dalliance with diesel engines and ships. In 1920, the company had built the cargo vessel Glenapp and fitted her with two diesel engines, now these motors were enormous, standing the height of a two-story building, but despite their size, they were surprisingly underpowered. They could only generate 4,500 brake horsepower. It meant that Glenapp could only amble along at 12 and a half knots. Now by 1924, maybe Kilsant thought the technology had been refined and Asturias's engines would be far more powerful. The diesel engines were installed with eight massive cylinders each and both capable of about 10,000 indicated horsepower making Asturias the most powerful motor ship in the world. With 20,000 horses pushing them through the water, Kilsant must have thought that Asturias and her subsequent sister ship would easily hit their 20 knot speed target. That's 23 miles per hour, or about 37 kilometers per hour, by the way. In 1926, the ship was completed and ready for her sea trials. The motors were worked up and the ship roared through the water at cruising speed, 16 and a half knots. She could go faster, but it would mean that the engines would be at full throttle the entire time, burning fuel and money. Even then, she couldn't hit 20 knots. Now, if Royal Mail Line was a normal customer, they would have flat out rejected the ship then and there, and then Harland and Wolf would need to either cover the cost of re-engining or come up with some kind of clever solution. But as it was, there was only one person to blame. Lord Kilsant. He had chaired both companies, and he had decided on the engines. The pair of sisters Royal Mail Line desperately needed to service one of their most competitive and lucrative routes were a pair of white elephants. In fact, their French competitors, Company de Navigation Sud Atlantique, had a pair of ships on the route that could easily hit 20 knots and beat Asturias and Alcantara to Buenos Aires by days. But the most embarrassing thing about this was that one of the French ships, the Lutetia, was over a decade older than Asturias, which was then Britain's newest liner and one which had been heavily marketed and proudly proclaimed to be the most powerful motor ship in the world. It would take a few more years yet for diesel engines to be perfected, but it seems that in 1925, Kilsant had jumped the gun. By 1931, Lord Kilsant was in jail. Now I've covered why in my video about the cancelled super ocean liner that White Star Line was planning called the Oceanic. It's well worth a look, because it's a wild story. But the gist of it is that he was jailed for fraudulent activity, and Asturias and Alcantara were having their butts kicked on the South Atlantic route by German and French competitors. Royal Mail Line, now under new leadership, began to float the idea of replacing the ship's engines to get them up to speed. They gave the task to Harland and Wolfe on the condition that the yard could put in new machines that would get the ships up to at least over 18 knots. Now the yard agreed and got to work, but they knew that for every knot slower than that speed, they would need to have to pay out a penalty. They ripped out the underperforming diesels and put in six powerful turbines instead, as well as boilers generating superheated steam. The result was a 25% increase in power, and the two ships could at least hit just under 20 knots. They remained in service up until the 1950s, but the failure of their original designs was just another blight on Kilsant's career. 
As a curious footnote, in 1957, Asturias was awaiting scrapping at Fast Lane in Scotland when a film production crew asked for permission to use her for a movie. They repainted part of the hull and Asturias played the role of Titanic in scenes where the ship's boats are being lowered for the movie A Night to Remember, which is all the more fitting because both ships were even built at the same shipyard. Now Asturias and Alcantara are an interesting case study because although their engines were underpowered, the designs of the ship's hull and interiors were sound, so all they needed was to be re-engined. But some design errors are actually way more serious because they're built into the ship's very structure, it's, it's skeleton, it's steel. This can result in some quirky behaviour at best, but at worst, it can lead to the deaths of many, many people. Take for example the German ocean liner Imperator. She was intended to be a response to British superliners like Mauritania and Olympic. The mastermind behind the ship, Hamburg America Line's brilliant Albert Barlin, intended for the ship to be the first in a trio designed to absolutely outdo the British in every way. In itself, it's a fascinating story, and we've also done a video on that too. I'll put a link in the description. But in 1906, the biggest ship that Germany had ever built was the SS Kaiserin Augusta Victoria at about 24,000 gross registered tons, but Imperator would be twice that size. Now, building a ship that big is a huge learning curve that the German shipyard Vulkanwerke was happy to take on. The design called for an immense ship with three towering smokestacks and ornate interiors that were modelled on some of the most famous hotels in the world, specifically the Ritz. In 1913, Imperator set out on her sea trials and her builders and owners must have been extremely proud because they'd achieved their goal. Imperator's interiors certainly put the newest British liners to shame, but there was a huge problem. The designers had messed up somewhere along the way because Imperator didn't seem to want to stay on an even keel. The ship's desire to list over to one side has become legendary. Passengers on some of the earlier voyages were so dismayed they gave her the nickname Limperator. Now the ship's hull was huge and towering and the smokestacks on top stood the height of a five-story building. It meant that the ship's centre of gravity was just way too high. Urgent calculations must have been done by the builders because they figured that she was safe enough to operate, but that she would exhibit some quirky habits, namely responding to any rubber inputs by lazing over to about 5 degrees and staying there. She wasn't at risk of capsizing, but the ship was clearly unstable. It would need to be rectified, but it was too late. The much publicised maiden voyage was coming up. Imperator set to sea, it's actually hard to find a bit of footage or a photograph that shows the ship on an even keel. This coupled with electrical failures and fires resulted in Hamburg America Line pulling Imperator from service just one season into her career for a full refit. Now they did everything they could to fix the issues. First, the funnels were cut down in height by as much as 3 metres, or almost 10 feet. And then 2,000 tonnes of cement was poured into the ship's double bottom to act as ballast. Passenger cabins were attacked as well, marble bathtubs were ripped out, and they were replaced with cast iron ones which were actually lighter. Decorative panels made out of marmor, a kind of marble, were replaced with plaster, and then heavy wooden furniture was ripped out and replaced with cane. In 1914, Hamburg America Line held their breath as the new and improved Imperator entered service, but then they were dismayed to find that the changes had done relatively little to help. In the 1920s, the ship's new owner's Cunard Line had a go at solving the problems too, but even they couldn't do it. The simple issue of her centre of gravity was so ingrained in the vessel's bones that it couldn't be overcome with simple fixes. Honestly, in my opinion, to solve it, probably an entire upper deck at least would have needed to have been taken off. In the end, the ship had a successful career, but her quirky lean to one side has become the stuff of legends. Imperator's design fault led to behaviour that was just that. Quirky. If it was that dangerous, I can't imagine the Hamburg America line or even their builders would have allowed the Imperator to go to sea in the first place. But sometimes design faults can slip through the cracks that are much more serious, even though they might seem, at first glance, glaringly obvious. In 1906, a pair of sister ships were introduced that were celebrated for their modernity and their luxury, but which actually harboured a deadly secret that would result in the deaths of over a thousand people. In the early 1900s, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company wanted to up the standards of its transatlantic fleet. The company ran a fleet of running mate steamships between Liverpool and Quebec, but they were simple, utilitarian passenger cargo vessels that put just as much emphasis on the cargo as they did the passenger. 
Canadian Pacific's dream was to build a celebrated pair of liners to bring standards of luxury to that route that had previously only been seen on board the most celebrated liners of the day, which sailed on the prestigious service to New York. The result was a pair of ships built at the famous Fairfield Shipyard in Govan, Scotland, Empress of Britain, and Empress of Ireland. The two ships were of medium size, about 14,000 odd gross registered tons, but what they lacked in size they made up for in modernity. The ships featured electric lights throughout, and modern fixtures like flushing toilets and call buttons. Passenger spaces were lush and comfortable, they brought a whole new standard of luxury to the route, and in that regard, Canadian Pacific Line absolutely nailed their brief. The lounges, cafes, ornate stairwells and smoking rooms were a huge hit when the ships were first introduced, but what Canadian Pacific Line was most proud of was the modernity and safety of the two ships, because they had done everything in their power to up the standards of safety at sea as well. In the decades leading up to the introduction of the Empress Sisters, a series of maritime disasters had guided shipbuilders in how to protect their ships. The most obvious takeaway was the need for a double bottom, and then compartmentalisation. Now a double bottom was like an inner skin on the ship's lowest point that would protect it from damage from below, the second skin would trap water and prevent it from flooding into the ship, but the hull could still be damaged from the side. So to stop water from flooding freely throughout the ship, the hull was split into sections called compartments, which were separated by watertight bulkheads. Tall steel walls rising up from the bottom of the ship that could be sealed off by watertight doors. Now, if the hull was damaged in one spot, the flooding would be contained to that one compartment. In later years, the watertight doors could be closed electronically from the bridge, but in the Empress of Ireland's day it was still largely a manual process. So the crew were trained and drilled in the event of an emergency to take heavy brass keys and then manually hand crank the two dozen watertight doors shut. In practice tests, this could be done in less than three minutes, which is fairly impressive. Now the Empress of Ireland and her sister ship featured ten bulkheads that rose through the hull as high as the shelter deck, creating eleven compartments. The Board of Trade regulations had stipulated since 1890 that ships longer than 425 feet in length be designed to remain afloat with any two adjacent compartments flooded. Now we'll call this factor floodability. It's the amount of compartments that could be flooded without the ship being lost. Floodability relied on a few things, mainly that the flooded compartments remain watertight. This posed a problem for designers and builders. People, passengers and crew alike needed to walk through the ship along its length to be able to get around. So bulkheads rising up from the bottom of the ship can then intrude on passenger spaces, making navigating very difficult. It also adds more doors for the crew to close in an emergency. So for reasons like this, back in the day, watertight bulkheads did not rise to the top of the hull, but only as high as some of the lower passenger decks. Now, this would prove suitable for most situations because it would mean that the water just couldn't spill over the top and keep flooding the ship, so long as the doors were shut. Now, this is all common knowledge now thanks to the Titanic disaster. That ship was designed to stay afloat with three or four compartments breached, but in the event more were flooded, creating a cascading domino effect that sank the ship. On the Empress Sisters, the compartments had to be designed to make sure that if any two adjacent compartments were flooded, the margin of buoyancy would not be exceeded and the ship wouldn't sink. If two compartments were made too big, for example, then in an emergency, their combined volume would pull the ship down and sink it, because the ship would be made far less buoyant. And here is where the Empress's designers made their first misstep, because two of their compartments were far, far too big. It was the engine and boiler room compartments that were the largest of their kind because of the size of the machinery they had to house. In the dead centre of the ship was a pair of cavernous boiler compartments, separated by a single tall watertight bulkhead and a series of large coal bunkers. Now the compartments were huge, they were 87 feet or 26 and a half metres long compared to the forward compartments which were about half that length. If open to the ocean and flooded, the Empress of Ireland should still have been able to stay afloat, providing the watertight doors were closed, but then only barely because the compartments were so voluminous. If they were flooded, it would come dangerously close to exceeding the margin of buoyancy and the ship would sink. There was absolutely no margin for error. With those two compartments flooded, the Empress could take on absolutely no more water whatsoever or she'd sink like a rock. Now her designers knew this. Unfortunately, it was a necessary evil to make those compartments so big purely because of the size of her boilers. Now to compensate for this, 
they came up with what they thought was an ingenious solution. They could take the compartments and then subdivide them even more into something like mini compartments that would slow or maybe even stop the spread of flooding water. They couldn't do it across the width of the ship because the crew would still need to be able to get around through the boiler room as easily as they worked, so instead they could do it down the ship's length, adding things called longitudinal bulkheads that split one half of both boiler rooms essentially into two. In the empty space, they added storage for coal. It meant that if a boiler room was breached, only half of it would flood. Simple. And besides, the odds of a ship being hit dead centre like that must have seemed extremely low. With the job well done, the ships were built and introduced, and they served well for the better part of a decade. But then in 1914, the worst case scenario played out, and the Empress's Achilles heel was revealed. In a dense fog, the Empress of Ireland was rammed dead centre by the coal-carrying ship Storstad, and honestly, it's almost as if the disaster had been designed as a kind of engineering experiment, because the Empress was hit in exactly the worst possible spot. At least 15 to 20 feet of Storstad's bow, which by the way was designed and heavily reinforced specifically for ice breaking, plunged deep into the Empress, creating a gash which stood stories tall. Suddenly, the celebrated safety measures which had been put in by her builders were put to the test, but there was an immediate series of problems. See, when Titanic had hit its iceberg two years earlier, something like 12 square feet of the hull was opened up, allowing water to slowly come in and fill the ship over about two hours. But the Empress of Ireland was opened up to the river right between her two boiler rooms with a hole allowing 60,000 gallons of river water, that's a quarter of a million litres, to enter the ship every second. Now the stewards rushed to their posts to shut the doors and make the compartments watertight, but they were immediately overwhelmed. Stewards in third class were met with a tidal wave of river water that drowned them all on the starboard side of the ship, and the doors remained open. In the boilers, the stokers didn't even have a chance at closing the doors, they did their best just to run out of the way. So now, the two largest compartments were open to the St. Lawrence River, and flooding incredibly quickly. The Empress's margin of buoyancy would be exceeded, and she would sink. But, the designers had foreseen this. Remember, the Empress's boiler rooms had those longitudinal bulkheads designed to split the massive compartments into two and keep flooding restricted only to one side. This choice would have devastating consequences for passengers and crew because as soon as she began to flood, the water's flow was hampered by the longitudinal bulkheads, meaning the starboard side of the ship had taken on tons and tons of water that the port side didn't. The ship leant over in the water so severely that the lifeboats on the port side of the ship were useless as they soared higher and higher in the air, and they swung inwards. Worse still, on the inside, passengers struggled against the lean as they tried to escape desperately through stairways and spaces that were now almost impossible to climb out of. With only one side of the boiler compartments fully flooded, and the water flooding unimpeded into other compartments, the Empress wallowed in the water, until finally the inevitable happened. With the starboard side of the ship settling lower and lower into the water, now portholes which were open on that side began to allow water in too. The ship's centre of gravity was met, then exceeded, and then she rolled over, dramatically, not fully capsizing, but coming to rest on her side. In the end, some 1,012 people died as a result of the Empress of Ireland sinking. The ship was always going to sink. That blow from the Storstad was an absolute killer, and there was nothing the poor stewards and crew could do to shut the watertight doors. But in the event the ship had been built without the longitudinal bulkheads, the boiler rooms would probably have flooded evenly and brought the ship a little bit more time. She would have begun to sink on a fairly even keel, enabling people to escape, lifeboats on both sides of the ship to be swung out and lowered. It would have saved dozens more lives at least. If the ship had been sailing through the fog with her watertight doors shut as a preventative measure in the first place, she wouldn't have sunk at all. Nowadays, ships at sea have their most critical watertight doors shut by default. It makes it more difficult to get around, but it means that in the event of an emergency, the most important compartments will already be made watertight and the flooding will be contained. Now this was actually put to the test in the 1990s when a cruise ship almost sank. In 1998, the Monarch of the Seas grazed a reef off St. Martin's, which opened up a monumental gash in the ship's hull, about 130 feet or 40 meters long and 6 foot 7 or 2 meters wide. Now the ship began to immediately take on water and sink down by the head, so the captain grounded her on a sandy shallows and evacuated the passengers, 
Now, a subsequent report found that an incredible amount of the ship had been opened to the ocean, with three whole watertight compartments breached and flooded, and 16 tanks and spaces in the double bottom flooded as well. But Solas, the body responsible for maritime safety, found that the ship would have been able to stay afloat if she hadn't been beached anyway, because the ship still had plenty of reserve buoyancy, and the flooding had been contained because the watertight doors were shut. Now, unfortunately, safety lessons usually come at the cost of human lives, and in the case of longitudinal bulkheads that run along the ship's centre line, it was found after the Empress of Ireland's loss that they had actually contributed to the loss of life. A centre line subdivision was dangerous. It split massive compartments into two, it meant that the ship would lean dangerously over in the water if flooded. Instead, machinery spaces could be split safely into three or four with longitudinal bulkheads because it meant that if one was flooded, it wouldn't be a big enough space to make the ship list. As tragic as stories like this are, their continuing legacy today is the improvement of safety standards, and lessons learned the hard way in the past are continuing to help save lives today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below, or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.